Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sally Clark? Other questions here would include, did bad statistics convict an innocent person? And what is the prosecutor's fallacy? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of Sally Clark, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, and then I'll offer my analysis, including an explanation of the prosecutor's fallacy. Sally Clark was born in England in 1964. Her father was a police officer and her mother was a hairdresser. She went to Southampton University and studied geography and worked at a couple different banks. In 1990, she married a man named Steve Clark. He was a solicitor. She decided to pursue the same line of work. She went to the University of London and trained at a law firm. She and her husband bought a house together in 1994, and she started working for a law firm in Manchester. On September 26, 1996, Clark gave birth to a son, Christopher. He was healthy, but on December 13, Clark called an ambulance to her residence. She and Christopher were the only ones in the house. Christopher was unconscious. He would be declared dead after being taken to the hospital. Clark received counseling because she was depressed after Christopher's death. On November 29, 1997, she would give birth to another son, Harry. On January 26, 1998, when Clark and Harry were the only ones in the residence, Harry was found dead. On February 23, 1998, both Sally and Steve Clark were arrested on suspicion of murder. Later, only Sally was charged with murder the case against Steve was dropped. Both Sally and Steve denied any wrongdoing. Sally Clark would go on to have a third son as the criminal case was proceeding. Her trial started on October 11, 1999. The trial was straightforward in a sense. The prosecution said Clark committed murder, and the defense said that both her sons died from SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, also referred to as cot death. The prosecutor's case involved a key expert witness, Professor Sir Roy Meadow. He was a former professor of pediatrics. He would later be discredited, but at this time he was well respected. Meadow testified that the chance of two children from an affluent family dying from cot death was 1 in 73 million. He arrived at this calculation because only one child out of 8,543 children from that population would die from cot death. He then squared the value to arrive at 1 over 73 million. By his calculation, a double cot death would be expected to occur in Britain once every 100 years. Meadow came to the conclusion that there was a 1 in 73 million probability that Sally Clark was not guilty of murder. Meadow's testimony about statistics was seriously flawed. I will explain what was wrong with this testimony in my analysis. Clark was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. During her first appeal, the erroneous statistical calculations were exposed, but her conviction was not overturned. During her second appeal, the bad statistics were once again part of her argument, as well as evidence regarding the presence of harmful bacteria in Harry. This evidence had been known by the prosecution since 1998, but they had not revealed it. The finding regarding the bacteria supported the idea that Harry died from natural causes. Clark was released in 2003, but the experience of being falsely convicted and imprisoned was too much for her. She felt betrayed by the law. It challenged her understanding of its value. She had a great respect for the law, which was prominently featured in her career choice. She was diagnosed with a number of mental disorders and started consuming excessive quantities of alcohol. She would die of acute alcohol intoxication on March 16, 2007. Now moving to my analysis. I'll start by explaining what was wrong with Meadows' testimony about statistics. There were three key mistakes with it. I'll cover each of them here. The first mistake was Meadows' assumption that because Sally Clark belonged to this affluent population, she had every characteristic of that group. This is called the ecological fallacy. In Britain, the probability of a child dying from SIDS is 1 in 1300. That would have been the correct value to use. Moving to the second mistake, 
By squaring the 1 over 8,543 value, Meadow was assuming that the probabilities were independent. When probabilities are independent, that means the chance of one occurrence is unrelated to the chance of another. If someone rolls a die and gets a 3, the chances that they will get a 3 on a second roll are the same as they were on the first, 1 and 6 for both. The chances of rolling 3 twice in a row, so two independent events, would be 1 in 36. This is 1 in 6 squared. When looking at death by SIDS, occurrences are not independent in one family because siblings share genetic and environmental characteristics, which put them at increased risk. If one child in a family dies of SIDS, there's a 1 in 100 chance that another sibling in the family will also die of SIDS. Using the accurate statistics, we now see that instead of 1 in 73 million, the odds of two children in the same family dying of SIDS would be 1 in 130,000. That is 1 in 1,300 multiplied by 1 in 100. Now that still seems like a very low probability, and it is, but it's how we interpret the probability that matters. This brings me to the third mistake that Meadow made. His third error is referred to as the prosecutor's fallacy. Here's how this works. The prosecutor's fallacy is when a prosecutor or anybody tries to claim that the probability of the evidence given innocence is equal to the probability of innocence given evidence. Here's what this means. All the possible causes and their corresponding probabilities need to be considered together. We can't look at just the probability of natural causes and nothing else. We also have to look at the probability of murder. Once an event has already occurred, like two children in the same family dying, those are the two explanations for that specific event. The probability of it happening to two random children in the same family from the population has nothing to do with a specific person's guilt. When looking at the deaths in this case, there are natural causes and murder. Those are the two possibilities, considering the death has already happened. One of those explanations must be valid. Again, we have to look at the specific case. There has been a death. That death has been caused by natural causes or murder. We have to look at the probability of each. Those relative probabilities must be compared to one another. Both probabilities must be in that equation. Moving away from this specific case, I'll use another example which illustrates this well. Let's say that you're working as a police officer in a small town. A murder occurs in that town. Even though the town has 10,000 people, due to the circumstances surrounding the crime, you know that only 100 people could have committed it. Like they had the ability to commit the murder, no alibi, they were in the vicinity, factors like that. On the victim's body, blood not belonging to the victim is identified. Let's assume the donor of that blood is definitely the killer, which of course would not necessarily be true, but for the sake of this example, we'll pretend it's true. Let's also assume that in this town, there's a budget crisis. Perhaps the mayor of the town was having an affair and spending the town's money on expensive gifts for his mistress, so there is no DNA testing. Only the blood type can be determined. The blood type of the blood found in the victim is B, but we don't know whether it's positive or negative. Again, corrupt mayor. Therefore, you know that 10% of the population has the same blood type as what was found on the victim. A random suspect from the 100 possible killers is taken into custody. It is known that the suspect has type B blood. The prosecutor's fallacy would argue that the probability of the evidence given innocence is 10%, which is true. But here is where we see the mistake. It would go on to say, therefore, the probability that the suspect is innocent given the evidence is also 10%, meaning there's a 90% chance he is guilty. This, of course, is not true because we know that there are nine other people in that sample of 100 possible killers who also have type B blood. Again, the probability of the evidence given innocence is not the same as the probability of innocence given evidence. There's a massive distinction between those probabilities even though in certain circumstances, of course, they could be quite similar. Only the second probability, the probability that someone is innocent, is relevant to court cases. By the way, in this example, the mayor did it, just to remove the mystery. With this example using the 10% probability that a person will have type B blood, it's easy to see how illogical the prosecutor's fallacy really is. But when using smaller probabilities, 
it can be easy for people to forget the same principle still applies. For example, moving back to the case of Sally Clark, that one in 130,000 probability of evidence given innocence seems like bad news for Clark. But we also need to know the probability of a double murder. Those two probabilities are the ones we need to compare. As it turns out, when comparing both, we see that there's actually a two out of three chance that Clark was innocent, that SIDS explained the deaths. The one in 130,000 is not relevant because, again, the event already occurred. We are restricted to the explanations that can explain the event. It either has to be a double fatality from SIDS, which is rare, or a double homicide, which is also rare. Which one is more likely? Again, we know that the SIDS explanation is more likely. So looking at this case, at the second appeal, the court said that even just looking at the statistical errors alone, they would have overturned the conviction. But how could the court hearing the first appeal have upheld Clark's conviction? The court was not sufficiently influenced by the argument that the statistics were bad. Amazingly, even though statistics is a fairly complicated field, courts often view statistical reasoning as common sense, an area that does not require expert testimony. The first court of appeal basically said that the jury could figure it out based on the evidence presented. Keep in mind, the jury did not have an explanation given to them about how the statistics were wrong. It doesn't make any sense that they would doubt the expert testimony of Meadow, and even if they did, they probably were not aware of the prosecutor's fallacy. I believe there's a good chance that the court simply didn't understand the prosecutor's fallacy. The first court of appeal referred to the bad testimony on statistics as merely a distraction. I'm sure that courts appreciate the value of other fields in proceedings like DNA, ballistics, cybersecurity, mental health. Yet with those fields, would they just assume the jury understands the science behind them without an explanation? Out of all the fields to pick as one to minimize, it doesn't make sense to me that the court would pick statistics. If they said, look, we don't need an expert in geography to tell the jury where a murder took place. Okay, I agree with that for most situations. We don't need a meteorologist to tell the jury that it was raining on the day of the murder. All right, fair enough. But to say that you don't need someone trained in statistics to make an argument about probability, that seems as though the Dunning-Kruger effect was well represented in the court. Another factor here, Roy Meadow was the wrong expert. A mental health professional trained in statistics would never testify about bacteria. Why would a pediatrician testify about statistics? It would appear that the court also didn't understand the idea of how people who are experts only testify in their area of expertise. A court of law is different than the person's practice, where they might say things that are somewhat unrelated to their field. We're talking about expert testimony. There's every opportunity in these situations to bring in people who understand their fields quite well. The court seemed to believe that Roy Meadow could testify about anything. Interestingly, Roy Meadow said that he did not claim to be a statistician. As if Meadow did not do enough damage, he left the world one more gift, Meadow's Law. It states, One sudden infant death in a family is a tragedy. Two is suspicious and three is murder unless proven otherwise. This law has potentially influenced the outcome of other investigations and court proceedings. For example, the case of Kathleen Folbig featured an expert witness who cited Meadows' law. Probability theory is not common sense. I understand why prosecutors and jurors invest in the prosecutor's fallacy. At first glance, it's easy to look at this testimony and think that it's logical. So was Sally Clark actually guilty? Well, from a statistical perspective, no. There was certainly reasonable doubt, and I think she was actually truly innocent. Her innocence was no match for the reckless overconfidence of Roy Meadow, and a court who was unwilling to listen to a counter-argument. Just when Sally Clark thought she lost everything, this conspiracy of nonsense said, no, we can take more away. And that is exactly what they accomplished. Those are my thoughts on the case of Sally Clark and the prosecutor's fallacy. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.